Welcome to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. Ross Brannan is a financial advisor who knows it's not just about your teeth. He helps dental practice owners protect and maximize today's cash flow to plan for tomorrow's cash needs. Find him at rossbrannan.com. On the show, he brings together experts to help dental professionals looking to make smart money decisions to grow their income, turn their retirement goals into reality, and improve their lives. And now, here's your host, Ross Brannan. Welcome to the show. My guest today is Stephen Nance. Stephen is a CPA partner and vice president at Drill Down, Drill Down Solution, a firm that provides financial services for dentists, including accounting, bookkeeping, consulting, and more. He's been with the firm since 2014, and today he joins us on the Financial Flossing Podcast. Stephen, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Ross. Sure thing. All right. So I read about you on your website. And I saw your little kind of a bio and I was really, really concerned. And I want to just get this out in front of the podcast here. You were formerly an auditor for the state of Utah Department of Revenue. And I want to make sure that you let everyone know on the call before we get going, you're a good guy. You're on the good guy. You're on the, yeah, you're on the right I'm, side now, right? I've been on the light side for seven years. Okay, good, good, good. I thought that was hilarious. We talked about that before um, and, and joked about it. So so anyway, kind of tell us your story. Um, you know, you have a personality, so therefore you're different than most accountants. Uh, <laughs> so, and nothing against accountants at all, but it's it tends to be a, a little more of a reserved personality. What made you want to get in accounting and how, how'd you get going? Yeah. So my dad was an accountant and he actually worked for the IRS. Oh, so wow. There's, there's two strikes against me, but I saw that as kind of, I mean, I was exposed to it. But I actually wanted to go to law school at first when I started college. Met my wife, we got married, and we wanted to start a family and decided that law school is going to delay that more than uh, getting a master's in accounting and going the CPA route. So accounting started as a backup plan, ended up being the full plan, and, and I've been happy ever since. So it's been well, that, that's, that's great. So at Drill Down, your clients are almost all dentists. Tell me why you think there's such a need for an accounting firm exclusively for dentists to begin with. Yeah. And to be clear, we're not exclusively dentists, but we, we specialize in dentists and dental intelligence, a big software analytical company for dentists was actually birthed uh, by our founders in our firm, uh, right in the offices I'm in right now. Um, oh, wow. And we're still uh, connected with them. And I've done taxes and accounting for many different types of industries. We decided two or three years ago to make a focus exclusively for dentists. And when you have your accountant doing your taxes or your planning or whatever, there's things that can be just missed uh, that, that a dental CPA will be able to catch. Planning opportunities, for example, the R&D tax credit for dentists and how that could work. And also looking at more than just the tax side of things, but some benchmarks. Here's where some expense, some revenue, some net profit numbers should be based off of your history and based off of the industry that someone who doesn't specialize in dental CPA work is not going to be able to guide you on. So there is a whole lot more value than a, that a dental CPA can provide you than just someone who does general CPA work. Well, you said the magic word there. Uh, so we got to talk about that. You, you said the word planning, tax planning. Yep. And uh, obviously, if anyone has listened to this podcast, they know my take on the basic, uh, typical CPA. You and I have had this conversation how many CPAs, unfortunately, are history reporters, and they don't really want to kind of learn how to legally reduce taxes. So talk a little bit about what you do to help tax plan for your client. Yeah, and that's exactly right. Planning is what it's all about. Anyone can really do a tax return. Uh, planning is where we can provide value to our clients. And what we do is we proactively schedule our planning meetings. Most of our clients are on a monthly subscription model with us, and that'll include either annual or quarterly planning based on what they need or want. But what we'll do is we'll we'll sit down and we'll project out their income for the year based off of 
some prior year information, current year, year to date information, and just talking through kind of what they're seeing coming down the pike for them, projecting their income, projecting their tax. And okay, this is what you're looking at from a tax hit next April, if we don't do anything differently. And that's our starting point. And from there, it's a discussion of what do you need? How much money are you willing to, to put down to save on taxes? And what's, where's, you know, the cost benefit for them. Here's, here's some risks with, with certain strategies. Here's some investments that will improve your business, but what's worth it to you. Some people tell me, you know, I don't, I'm good paying my taxes, but they want to know what those taxes are in advance. And that's what's most important. And then there's a whole lot of strategies that we can look at once we have projected where they're at and we can tailor those and give them the options that they need so that they can make great decisions before the year is over. Because once the year is over and we're doing the taxes, generally it's too late to, to execute on any of those tax savings opportunities. Yeah, it's critical. You're given, you're, you're looking ahead well in advance, meeting with clients quarterly and giving them the opportunity to vote on uh, reducing their taxes. That's fantastic. It, it would, so much money is left on the table. I like to say that the highest rate of return you're ever going to get is a dollar taken back from the IRS. So I like complicated issues and you like to help clients with complicated tax issues. What's a tax issue that dentists often struggle with in your experience? Yeah, one that comes to mind is they've got a lot of debt and a lot of their income that is being reported on paper is either going to pay down debt. They're not seeing this income necessarily. It looks like they're making some really good money, but they're not seeing it. But the tax code is seeing it. So we've got to help them through that process of how do we navigate that? How do we plan for it and reduce it where we can? And sometimes they've got all these debt and and they're used to living high lifestyles. They take distributions in excess of basis. And again, we've got a plan for that and mitigate that as much as we can. Yeah, that's a big deal. So what what would you say are some unique challenges that face by dentists? Obviously, you've worked with a lot of other industries and you still work with some other industries, but what do you see as a unique challenge that a dentist faces? Yeah, let me talk about a few of them here. So one is the debt. That's a that's a, a challenge that is inherent in the dental industry. There's a lot of debt, uh, but they need debt to get going and to really keep their practices modern and things like that, which is a challenge that just needs to be worked through. Another one is that the dental industry is changing quite a bit for a couple of reasons. One is the DSOs are playing a bigger part and you know, for someone who's looking at selling their practice, there's a decision. Do I, do I sell to a DSO? Or do I sell to someone privately? And also it, it increases the competition in the market. Another one is the insurance industry. Dentists are continued to get their reimbursements from insurance reduced. Even though they're seeing their costs raised, we're in a big inflationary state right now. They're seeing their costs increase, but the insurance companies are still trying to nickel and dime them and reduce that. So that's that's a big challenge. And and the key is looking at do looking at you know your fee for service and negotiating the insurance, but structuring your practice in a way that makes sense so that you can overcome and, and really be in control of that, if that makes sense. How many of your clients are going cash only? And they're dropping exactly. insurance. How many of your clients are oh. dropping insurance and going cash only? Yeah, not very many. I do have some. It depends on if they have a specialty or if they're in a lucrative area. I've got a practice down in the in San Diego that's in a in a pretty posh area, and they do some celebrity work and stuff like that. So you know, if if you can do that, you're gonna. I mean, that's the way to make to keep right. your production revenues. But it's a struggle when you're doing general dentistry and you're in an area that doesn't support that. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That makes sense for sure. So what advice do you commonly give dentists? Like if you know you meet somebody, they're a relatively new client, even if they're not new, what do you find yourself saying over and over to dentists? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I'm just thinking through here, but really it comes back to the planning and planning ahead for taxes. I, I don't know that it's 
but it's one specific thing really. But what they, what they all need is that planning where they're knowing ahead their tax situation and can make decisions accordingly. Well, we've all heard stories of someone just getting their, just getting punched in the gut on April 14th, yep. owing an astronomical number to them. Yep. And either either them not having the money for it, or if they did have the money for it, it just knocked them sideways. I mean, it's funny. I have a friend who he got one of those calls and it was a half a million dollars that he owed. He found out on the on the 14th of April, obviously the day before tax day. And he vowed to never let that happen again. Yeah. And that's where he became an advocate for planning for sure. Yeah. So, you know, in my experience, certain demographics from an industry standpoint tend to operate a certain way. Mm -hmm. Physicians tend to operate a certain way and dentists tend to operate a certain way in certain respects from, from dealing with money. That being said, what kind of financial mistakes do you see that dentists most often make in your experience? Yeah. Two on both ends of the spectrum. One is the dentist who gets too excited about uh, the lifestyle that a dentist can provide. And they start taking more out of their practice than they should and, and living too, too good of a lifestyle before they should, before they get to the point where they can really support that. And they're, and a lot of times they're too focused on the tax side of things and they over, over in debt themselves with equipment purchases and things like that, that, yeah, you're going to get a tax savings from that, but it's not really worth it for what they need right now. And then they're taking money out of the practice. They create a distributions in excess of basis problem. It causes all kinds of stress in their personal life. That's one side of the spectrum. The other side is the person who's too conservative. And, you know, they get out of dental school. You want to pay off your debts. You've got all this debt, but you want to pay off your debt before you buy your own practice. You want to buy your own practice, but the, the quickest way to pay off your debts is getting ownership into a practice to where you can make more money and pay down those debts. So it comes back to balance and planning. A dentist, the dental profession is an awesome, awesome industry to go into. It can allow you to work three days a week and, and pull in a seven-figure income potentially. There's really nothing else quite like that and work the hours that you want to work. But it takes a lot of planning and a lot of looking at not just the clinical side, but the business side to make good financial decisions. Yeah, it is interesting. Balance tends to always be the best, the best way to go. But you do see people on both extremes living the high life, like you said, or uber conservative. I've met clients with almost seven figures, actually, you know, with seven figures in cash in the bank just because of uh, whatever. And so yeah. uh, it's interesting. So talk a little bit about, you know, what drill down does. Obviously the tax, I focus on the tax planning here and then yeah. there's the compliance work, meaning that the tax returns, but talk about everything that drill down does for clients. So we do bookkeeping and. And real quick, explain why it's really important yeah. that for you to do the bookkeeping, explain yeah. that. Yeah, good point. So first of all, we know it's going to be done right if it's done by us right. and it's going to be up to date. When we do planning for you and we don't have up to date, accurate financial information, that planning can have a margin of error. And the more accurate information we can get for planning, the more close we're going to be to what your actual taxes are going to be and, and what strategies actually make sense for you. So the tax side is one, but also we include some visuals and some benchmark reporting for our dentists. And some of this is relatively new and we're always trying to improve what we're doing, but having that can help you manage your overall financial picture, not just the taxes so that you can see where you're at compared to the industry, but also where you were compared to last month or last quarter and really uh, being a good position yourself to, to grow financially and, and meet your goals. Yeah, that's important right there. Now, obviously, I work with a lot of dentists. You work with a lot of dentists. I have seen the difference in dentists, in my opinion, is the ones who have learned how to work on their practice versus in their practice. Yeah. And talk about your perspective on that and what you've seen in that regard. So 
I mean, someone who goes to dental school, they learn how to be a good clinician and then you get experience and you, you can improve and, and you know, you're, you're required to, to get your CE and continually improve on the clinician side, but that doesn't do anything for the business side. And, and sometimes when you buy a practice, you can be a really great dentist, but if you don't pay attention to the numbers and the business side of things, your expertise on the clinician side and as a doctor is not transferring into value for you. So you've really got to, when you own your own practice, you've got to work on your business. And that can vary depending on what stage you are in your career. And at the stage of your practice, it may be, you know, starting with a day or half a day just to focus on the business. But then as you grow, that should really start flipping to where you're spending more time on your business than you are in your business. Yeah. You don't want to get stuck owning a job basically. Yeah. So we talked about this a little bit before offline, but um, unfortunately a lot of dentists get the advice to buy a piece of equipment around December for the Mm -hmm. purposes. And I'm sure all the dental equipment sales guys are all, they're working double duty in December to get a deduction for the purposes of purchasing equipment. Talk a little bit about that from the standpoint of maybe that's the right thing to do. Maybe it's not, but talk about why it might or might not be the right thing to do. Yeah. So if you own a dental practice, you need to be aware of the possibilities that when you get a piece of equipment right now and you put that into service, you can take full year depreciation in year one, which can be a great tax savings opportunity. And and, and, your and real quick, that means if you buy a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment, that's a hundred thousand dollar deduction against your income. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. So you need to be aware of that. And you know, when you're investing in your own business, that's going to create more value for you up to a certain point. So if you're if you've got if you're already up to date with what you need or a certain piece of equipment is going to cost you more than the value taxes aside there's no point in spending 100k on just to save you know thir- if you're in a 37% tax bracket you're saving $37,000 but it's costing you 100 so you're don't spend the dollar to save 37 cents yeah exactly and and over time that equipment is going to to depreciate and and all of that as well. So really look at when I when I talk about equipment, the, the equipment discussion, it's a matter of, hey, what what equipment are you already thinking about or could use in the next six months to a year that, hey, if you're going to do it anyway, let's get it in and start using it this year so you can get the tax benefit. But if you're on the fence and you're the cost doesn't really make sense without the tax discussion, then don't save the dollar to, to, or don't spend the dollar to save the 37 cents. Right. Let's look at other strategies or just plan on paying your taxes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's change gears here for a second. Are you a reader? And if you are, what's a great book that you've read recently? I'm reading this book right here, Pillars of Dental Success oh, by Mark okay. Costas. So I'm not finished with it, but you know, Mark Costas is a big name in the industry. It's a really interesting read and it's kind of his story of how he got into dental school, how he was getting through it, and then how he's, well, I'll see what the rest is, but really interesting read and from a great successful dentist out there. So what advice would you give a fresh dental school graduate? Well, I would talk to the, to that fresh dental school graduate on what their goals are, because I don't know that there's a one size fits all. I think most Dental school graduates probably want to own their own practice at some point. And the questions are, when? When do I do it? And do I actually go full on buying my own dental practice? Or do I you know, have this phantom entity where I'm working for a DSO kind of a thing? Or do I not own my own practice and just be an associate? And, and if so, is that forever or how long? Those kinds of questions. But it really depends on their goals. Because someone who just wants to work in people's mouths and doesn't want to deal with the stress of, of owning and managing their own business, then, then go be an associate and, or work for a DSO. But someone who does want to maximize their potential and whether they're 
interested in making a lot of money or just wanting to have the freedom of owning their own practice, let's talk about when to do that. And I'd say, you know, you got to work for a couple of years, get the experience, have some savings, pay the minimal on your student loan debt, but be ready to have some, some cash available and, and get into a practice as soon as you can after that year or two of, of starting out. That's great. So talk a little bit about here. What's the process? Like if someone said, hey, drill down and Steven sound great. What's the process of, of onboarding with a new client? So when a new client reaches out or a, a new prospect reaches out to us, we'll meet with them, talk with them. Uh, I want to get to know you and what you do, kind of a sense of what your goals are. And then, you know, talking about us, obviously, and, and giving you some options Again, there's not a necessarily one size fits all. So when a new client comes on, like I said, we, we have kind of a subscription model where it's a monthly fee that includes the taxes, the planning, basically everything you need, which by the way, uh, just as a tangent, that really facilitates the planning because people are not afraid of getting an hourly bill for contacting us mid-year about a question. That's, that's covered. But Depending on what you need, you might just need an annual planning. You might need quarterly. You might need bookkeeping. That that price can vary. And I want to give the potential client the option. What do you want to do? What do you want us to do for us? And here's the different options and go from there. So if someone wants to get in touch with you, well, how do they do that? Yeah, I'll give you my contact information. snance at drilldownsolution.com is my email. And make sure it's not drill down solutions. I made yeah. that mistake. S Nance, N A N C E, at yep. drilldownsolution.com. Yep, that's exactly right. We are the solution. There's not there, multiple solutions. There you go. There you go. <laughs> also, my phone number, 801 225 8474. And you have clients all over the country, correct? Correct. So, fantastic, guys. For listeners, you know, I'm really big on talking with CPAs who are going to be your advocate, who are going to help you save money. Uh, Steven is one of those types of guys. He's somebody who you should absolutely consider, you know, potentially hiring if that's right for you. They do a lot of good work here. They can help you guys out. Steven, thanks so much for hopping on the call today uh, on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ross. It was good to be with you. All right, guys, you've been listening to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan, and we will see you next week. This has been another episode of Financial Flossing with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. For more on Ross Brannan, visit rossbrannan.com. Registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 3664 Coolidge Court, Tallahassee, Florida, 32311, 850-562-9075. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. North Florida Financial is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0L10073. Arkansas Insurance License Number 161390032. 2021-1195-35. Expires 423. That last part can also say 2021 2021- 119535 expiration April 2023. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by PAS, Guardian, or North Florida Financial, and opinions stated are their own. Ross is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities LLC PAS. OSJ 3664 Coolidge Court, Tallahassee, Florida 32311 850-562-9075. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS member FINRA SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America. Guardian New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of
Guardian. North Florida Financial is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. Arkansas Insurance License Number 16139032, California Insurance License Number 0L10073, 2021129752, expiration 0623.